All right. Let's hope this goes slightly more smoothly than it did the other night. So um, this is the fourth or fifth in the series of Payback. And tonight I'm chatting to Matt Everett. Let's see if I can find him. Uh, it's been very interesting getting these started in the past. Let's see if it works better this evening. Oh, beautiful. This is going to go smoothly. So far, let's hope. I think Matt is going to be... Hello. Oh, can... There we go. Oh, Look nice... at that. <laughs> oh. oh, my. Nice, uh, nice hat. Thank you. Thank you. Nice jacket. Well, I'm, I'm funny you should mention that. I'm, oh. pay, I'm paying homage to uh, your old band. Oh, it's a menswear thing. Yep, and now that's done. I can take off this, <laughs> this, <laughs> this too small jacket. I can get rid of that now. So thank God that's over with. It's um, working, look. It's working. This is great. Oh, my God. I've had some experiences with this, which have just been terrible. Cheers, love. Cheers, sweetheart. Nice to see you. Hey, it's lovely to see you, too. Mm. Um, nice cap. Thank you very much. This is um, to deal with the, the hair situation. There's a hair situation. It's, it's not good. It's not good. So your, your partner's not any good at cutting hair? Because I've, I've had a go at it. I've had to cut my partner's hair. How did that go? And it turns out, if music doesn't work out, <laughs> and it's a, it's a, well, you know, there's a real lack of gigs. Festivals aren't going to be happening anytime soon, but I hear that hairdressing shops are going to be opening, and I think I may have a career in hairdressing. Yeah, we, I just had uh, Joseph, who you met on the phone the other day, who's 12, going... Because he started cutting his own hair a little bit before, before lessons and stuff. Um, and he was like, oh, can I, please, can I cut your hair? Can I cut your hair? Please, can I cut your hair? Please, can I cut your hair? I'm going, no, no. And he said, but look, look, the back of your neck is all like, you've got like, there's a hairy mole there. And it's all, you look, you look like a nan. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you put a cap on it instead. So I put a cap on it instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's working and it's suiting you. <laughs> Thank um, you. So normally with these, I kind of start by being like, why journalism? But I guess it's, it's slightly different with yourself because before you, before your foray into journalism, you were, you were a musician. I was um, in a band, yeah. You were in a band, two bands. Two bands. I, <laughs> um, I've been Googling. <laughs> I, I thought it was one. Turns out it's two. Um, yeah. Uh, people, uh, well, a few people have heard of the first one. No one's heard of the second one. I know all about them now. And, um, but yeah, but then after that, like, why, what was it that got you into music journalism? I didn't have a clue what I was going to do. I mean, it's not a lot. There's not much work for a, a mediocre drummer um, who's been in a couple of bands. It's, like, it, it's quite difficult to get another another good drumming job after you've been in two bands and that hasn't worked if you're not a really good drummer. And I was all right, but I wasn't great. So um, I just kind of, I floundered about afterwards, as, as lots of people do, you know, when, they, when you're in a band and it goes wrong for whatever reason. It's a kind of weird bit when you're like, what am I supposed to do now? You know, because most people, if you're in a band, it's all you've ever wanted to do since you were like, you know, 10 or 11 or something. It's all you, you carry your, your drums around on buses around Birmingham and you go to rehearsals. And you're just focused upon that. And then it all goes wrong. And you're like, I don't know what we're going to do now. So I worked in a video shop in Camden for about a year and a half. Like a blockbusters type thing. It was, it was a bit like that, but it was, um, it was like a little one-off store. Oh, indie. One... It was it was an indie VHS store. Was it the one that was opposite Sa the big old Sainsbury's? No, no, they were our competitors. Oh. They were our competitors. I used to go there. Right, okay, so yeah. terrible. <laughs> it was better than ours. And uh, doing this, doing this, this job, and just rented videos to people. Some people of which I used to kind of, you know, hang out with in bands and stuff, which was really, it was really good because after you know you sort of spend all your time traveling the world and thinking that you're brilliant, especially, you know, the sort of stupidity and arrogance that menswear had. And you kind of think, oh, all right, I've, I've got to find something, something proper to do. And it was really good to sort of bring my ego down, <laughs> crashing down to earth, because you're like, I'm selling copies of The Matrix on VHS to people that used to book me for concerts or go and see gigs. And it does, it rapidly knocks your, it, the chips off your shoulders. 
And then I just started writing for free. You know, do you remember the Fly magazine? Do you remember that? Yes, I remember the Fly. Uh -huh. Really as good it, free. As in like, was that with the, with the bar fly? Was it a Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So I just, um, I met the editor and just talked him into letting me do some little reviews and stuff. And that turned into interviews and that turned into lots of reviews and lots of interviews. And, and then... And, and then yeah. now you are six music sweetheart. <laughs> no, but uh, and then, but I, I think, you know, I've been, I've been going through so many of, um, I don't know if any, you know, I'm sure lots of people, especially my audience are going to be very, very aware of who you are. Because we have this mutual six music audience who are, are beautiful and, and what, yep. and, um, but you started doing the first time that series of interviews with musicians mm -hmm. and, and the list of musicians that you've interviewed is, is bananas. It's I mean, from nuts. like Elton John, Sinead O'Connor, my personal favorite, Tori Amos, Richard Hawley. I mean, I mean, there's so many, many amazing, amazing names on it. I mean, and it's, I mean, wasn't that, did you publish a book about yeah, it as well? There was a couple of years ago, there was a first time book, which was, it's, it's, Ridiculous. It's really funny. I don't know whether well, uh, it, it becomes the thing that you're sort of almost most proud of without even realizing you, you don't set out to do it as like a big thing. You just set out to do it because you're kind of interested. But yeah, there's like, you know, Robbie Robertson, Yoko Ono. It's, it's, what the fuck am I doing? In, what the fuck am I yeah. doing interviewing Yoko Ono? Um, as, as you say, like all of Radiohead. Um, all of the radio, all the heads of radio. I mean, all the heads of radio. <laughs> it's, it's, well, there's those as well. But I mean, I think one of me, I mean, the, the, the most beautiful, I mean, it's always trying to find a different angle with which to, because you're aware, I guess, from being a person who's been in a band as well and been asked all the questions. And so you're very familiar with the fact that it's just, so what's your process? And, uh, well, you know, <laughs> it, it, boring, bloody boring. But actually from, I'm going to be, uh, I'll send a link to, to the page where you can listen back to all these interviews of yours the first times. They're beautiful. And oh, thank you. And there's there's ones like artists that I love and I've you know I've I've researched them in the past and I've never ever had the insight that I've been given through your interviews in the first time. And That's it's really just sweet. there's if it's true. And there's this that it's a really simple, beautiful opening question which is just you always open it with when you were at, um, when were you first aware of music as a child? Yeah. It's gorgeous. And then it, you just get these, I mean, what, I, have you been surprised by the responses that you get to that question? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's funny because for me, the interview starts before the question starts. If there's someone that's, that's got a certain amount of weight behind them, then before that question starts, aside from doing all your research, you, I get really, really nerdy about this stuff like you the lighting's got to be right for that person when they walk in the room the first thing you say to them has got to be the right kind of thing to make them feel comfortable um the chairs have got to be the right height so they don't feel too high like all these little tiny details um what you might chat to them about in the as they're coming up in the lift all this stuff it sets the tone so when you get to the first question you in theory know how it's going to go or well, hopefully it's going to go all right. That's that's yeah. the thing. There, there's a real. I, I really I I don't think the interviews should be the sort of combative kind of like yes. And then I asked her this, and it caught her out. So she. I don't like all that. I like people to have a conversation like we're trying to do now. Even though I'm trying to not give interview answers because I was really nervous about this because I didn't. Oh, I. I have forgotten what it was like to be interviewed because I was shit at it when I was in bands. I was so bad. And the answers were, I was always trying really hard to be cool and I'm not cool or trying to be funny and I'm not funny and all these things. And so it always came over really, really badly. And I had totally forgotten about how awful it is to be interviewed. And all day I've been like, oh shit, I'm going to be asked questions. And I'm not, I got quite, I am quite nervous. Yeah. And it made me, it, it made me think, God, you and all the musicians that I interview, at least a lot of them, have got to go through that all the time. Am I going to come over like a dick? Is that a smart thing to say? Am I going to accidentally offend someone? Or is someone going to take something out of context? And I've forgotten all of that. 
so I now have you know there's more empathy I guess yeah and I think it's a I mean, it's always a re- I, the reason I started doing this was because I always found it the most bizarre kind of format, mm. an, an impolite format, having somebody ask me all these questions and not, be, and not asking them any questions back, one-sided conversations. I mean, I feel really impolite. And also, as you mentioned before, you would talk to people before you actually start the interview. There is a dialogue that precedes that, which is just, you know... Um, before that, so which is just you know, you know, how are you even? And it, like polite conversation, because often, as a musician, you're asked so many personal questions, and this is kind of a thing I wonder with you because with music journalists, I often spend time after the interview talk to the journalist, and then if we're in a pub, we'll stay in that pub, and <laughs> um, because you've always got the best stories as well, and I'm kind of itching to ask you questions back even to just kind of put this equilibrium back and get the politeness yeah. balance back. Um, but, you know, the fact that you spend so much time asking other people questions and often really personal questions, do you ever feel like you kind of adopt the role, like, you know, not purposely, but of therapist? Um, I sometimes, I find myself adopting characteristics and apparently this is a thing anyway that people do if you're in the pub or you're chatting to a friend. You, you, you adopt some of the verbal tics or the physical tics of someone that you're speaking to. So I find myself, if, if I don't know, if I'm interviewing Peter Gabriel and Peter Gabriel is, is leaning forward into his interview, I'll start leaning forward as well. Or if someone is swearing a bit, I'll swear a bit more. And it's totally unconscious. I guess that's me trying to sort of find a way to connect with them. I don't, I mean, am I a therapist? I, don't, I, I did an interview with Bernard Sumner, who is a really beautiful man. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I love Joy Division, I love New Order. They're incredible. And he's lovely because he's got, I love that, that difference between the importance of his band and the brilliance of his music and the weight of those bands and the weight of the music and how lightly he carries it. He's really funny. It takes the piss all the time. And I was asking about the first time wh- where he was when he first heard that Ian Curtis had died. And he told the story, he told me the whole story of exactly where he was about um, he'd gone, his mates got a speedboat, rented a speedboat for the day. So we'd been out in Manchester, just like uh, on the canals and stuff. And then and, and described the room he was sitting in uh, on the bedspread of his mum's bed when he picked up the phone next to the bed and he got told about it and he started crying and it just because then you're in this weird thing where you're like I I I don't know you I really admire you and I know a lot about you but I don't know you and he said look I'm really sorry I haven't talked about this for a long time and then you feel awful because you're like I don't want to be the person to dredge this up but at the same time I'm really interested in how you feel because that's something that's happened to you that changed the way you think about everything and so I think it's important in your life, this event. But I don't necessarily want to make you feel upset talking about it. Yeah, there, was, um, there was one interview of yours I listened to the other week. Was it with, um, oh, was it Butch Fig? No. Butch Fig was the other week, yeah. Yeah, and then, and then he offered some information to you, kind of similar, about yeah. his coming to London and when he'd first heard that Kurt Cobain had died as well. And, you know, and it's these kind of insights where... Yeah, I really appreciate the fact, and I'm sure all these other artists really appreciate the fact that you're not fishing for it, but you kind of, but you make a space whereby people feel comfortable enough, like to offer that information. Yeah, which is which is a really it's a really beautiful skill. Have there been? I mean, I mean, because yeah, you are a musician, and even any music journalist as well, you're going to be massive fans of a lot of people that you interview. There must have been some. Where you're just like, holy shit! Yeah, proper yeah. fanboying, which has been the the, the like, for you, the most kind of um, your biggest inspiration, like your biggest I, hero, heroine. I, 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 the fact I can say whenever I've interviewed Paul McCartney blows my fucking mind. <laughs> How did I the know fact... you were going to say Paul McCartney? Because like, I've actually, it's I've got, Paul I've, got a, I've actually made a bet 
with a, a few of our a few friends about yeah. about how long it's going to take until how we say Paul McCartney. Like, Every, everybody, <laughs> everybody, you put a fiver on it. Drink. But it, like, but what can I say? I interviewed Ringo, and I at one point in the middle of the interview, I just could, I was like, uh, 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 and he just went, "So all right, just ask me some questions." And I'll answer them. <laughs> he consoles like, oh, you. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, he consoled me. It's all right. Um, but yeah, like, and time, I interviewed Maka once. And then after, <laughs> I, I, I left, because we're like that. Yeah. I, I left his offices and burst into tears in the middle of Soho afterwards. Because it's like, it, and everyone's got those, because I, I was brought up with, with, with him. And he changed the fucking world. You know, so that's, that's, and I, I always, I always screw up interviews with Nick Cage so badly now that I don't do them anymore because like, he's really bad. Cause I love, I love Nick Cage. He's brilliant. He's so good. Um, but I'm just not equipped. I, and I'll happily sit down with anyone, pretty much anyone. And I think I'll do an okay job of interviewing them. I think I'll be all right, but not Nick Cage. I always screw up, no matter how hard I do the research, no matter how, and he's, he hasn't done interviews for ages, so it's been a while now. If I even, you know, he's been doing those, um, Q, not Q&A things, the concert in conversation things. Yes, I yeah. even managed where he plays some songs and he gets questions from the audience and they're, they're brilliant. They're really funny. They're really emotional. They're really honest. And I even managed to, even though I wasn't interviewing, I put my hand up towards the end of the Q&A thing after too many drinks and asked a question. I even fucked that up to the point <laughs> I asked him. So I wasn't even in a formal interview, like sort of position. And I still managed. And I know people that were at the same concert who later went, oh, were you that dickhead? Were you the drunk? Were you the arsehole that asked him? Because I had this question, like he was, you know, he looks immaculate. He always looks brilliant. In fact, always has like the kind of suiting and also the bad seeds yeah, look a I, certain way. I know him very well. He's my dad, carry on. Yeah. So, um, and, he, and I, I was trying to ask a question about it's that because he mentioned about how he wakes up, puts the suit on, and starts writing. And I was like, that's really interesting. About there's something there about getting going to work almost. You put the suit on, is, is the suit the character? Is it, is it something that you become a different person? And like, you know, all the, the old Motown session guys, who, yeah, you, you used to turn up in a suit and you went to work. Nine o'clock, we started playing, and you, that's how you, how we played. And I love that idea. That's the I, that was the question in my head. What came out of my mouth was something a bit like, "So, do you ever like wear like tracksuit bottoms or something when you're writing instead, Nick?" Or something like that. What? 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 And he was like, "What?" Yeah. You're in front of like this is at the Royal Festival Hall. There's thousands of people there. What? I'm like, what? "Do you want to know what's?" what's in my in my closet like yeah i'm not gonna fucking tell you <laughs> I love that. of and all that the of all the questions you could ask me yeah that you chose to ask me that, that was a good shape one there was a good question in there but it just came out really badly so drinking and interviewing just not well, a I, good i can make. confirm i can confirm he does wear um practical uh, clothing at times because I work in Brighton my studio is there and there's I go to a cafe because I know that Nick Cave goes to this cafe mm. and I've seen him wearing like a bright blue like north face like puffer jacket and, a, <laughs> and like and a beanie before I was so disappointed no but I bet you look great it, I, I, <laughs> yeah I bet he did he didn't um, <laughs> he didn't I mean there's like it, it's not that I want to get and honestly, I think especially at the moment, because it's like, it's, it's such, it's, I mean, these are such dire times and, um, and really unexpected as well. You know, it's, it's, we're, all, we're all struggling in our own way. And it's like, I do want to like, I do love the goss. And as much as I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm very curious about, you know, the hostile interviews when somebody has been, <laughs> when someone's been a bit of a dick. But I also just want to know like, yeah, the glorious ones, but, yeah, so has anyone ever been a bit of a dick to you? <laughs> um, well, I, I'm, quite, I'm quite lucky because most of the people that I interview, especially the first other people that I want to speak to, um, there's, but there's always, I did, an, I did an interview 
this was this was a long time ago. I did a phone interview with James Brown. I know. James uh, Brown. James Brown. And uh, I had the phone Hang call. Hang on. Um, James with... Brown from Pulled Apart by Horses or James Brown? James Brown. Good. Okay. Like, just, just checking. The Godfather of Soul. That's the one. Who apparently instead, you know, like two facts before I get to sort of one. When he died, no one actually knew for sure how old he was because his family was so impoverished. He had, there was no record of his birth. No, but yeah, yeah. Secondly, uh, it, was to- it, was, it was reported that he died on Christmas Day. From what I know, he didn't, but his management just basically thought it's a James Brown thing to do to say it's Christmas Day. So that's <laughs> when they said it was. That's what I've heard. Anyway, so um, I get a phone call uh, arranging to this, this, this call and there's an assistant who's like, right, um, Mr. Brown will call you at seven o'clock and uh, be waiting on the other end of the phone for him to call. So I wait, oh, s- seven o'clock and quarter past seven, nothing, half past seven, nothing. Uh, like quarter to eight, I get a phone call and it's his assistant going, right, um, Mr. Brown, you must refer to him as Mr. Brown, of course. Yeah. Uh, his manager will be calling you back in 15 minutes. Uh, super Frank. James Brown's manager at the time was called Super Frank. <laughs> of course he was. Obviously. And so I wait and, uh, for another 15 minutes and then like an, another half an hour and then the phone rings and it's Super Frank going, uh, Mr. Brown will be, will, will be calling you in about another 15 minutes. Uh, please refer to him as Mr. Brown. Um, it's like meeting the Queen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, please don't talk about that, blah, 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 his, his jail time. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm just happy to be speaking to him. Hmm. Uh, fine, so I wait. And eventually, after like another half an hour, the phone speaks up, and it's James Brown. And I start asking questions, and I cannot, and I'm recording this. I can't understand a single word he's saying, right? <laughs> Apart from at the end of every noise, he says, "So good." <laughs> no, he doesn't. So, so I'd say, oh, no, this, he no, this is completely true. So I'm saying, oh, you're coming over to Britain to receive this award. How does that make you feel? So good. <laughs> right, right, thank you. And I, 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 you don't stop the interview. Uh, another question. So um, you've recently, uh, there's been a tribute record to you and you were in the studio for the first time in five years. Can you tell me a bit about what it was like singing again? <laughs> single question ended with, it's all good. And it was getting to the end of my allotted 15 minutes of time that I had with him, or 20 minutes. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to ask a journalist if you can't, yeah, I can't understand what you're saying. But it was about the time that Michael Jackson uh, was having the kind of uh, one of his peaks of many legal sort of troubles. And I knew that Michael Jackson and James Brown knew each other. So I'm like, oh, I, I do have to ask you, Mr. Brown, uh, if you'd had a chance to speak to Michael or if you had any thoughts about the case. And he was like, <laughs> Bad. <laughs> <laughs> thank, and that was it. Thank, thanks for that. Was it. <laughs> thank you very much. As a bad. Fucking brilliant. I know. Fucking I know. Brilliant. Yeah. I'm really. <laughs> oh, I'm. I'm. I'm really glad that he ended with that. It's. It's bad. It's bad. Um, oh my god. There has to be. I mean, there's um, there's a whole bunch of um. The longer I do my job. The more, the more celebrities I meet. And what I love is like something you'd said before, is that, you know, you were really nervous um, about meeting someone, you get really like anxious about it. Like, oh my God, I hope I don't mind, oh, Nick Cave and blah, blah, blah. And I love that because it, it's kind of like, for musicians, there's like um, a correlation is like when they, when it gets to a stage when a musician no longer is nervous of going on stage, it's yeah. kind of, it's, it's, I mean, it's not necessarily true, but it, it, it's almost a sign that you don't care anymore, right. which right. isn't necessarily, yeah. not necessarily true, but for me. And so I, I, and, but I love the fact that like, no matter what happens in my career, like nothing's lost on me. And that's, that's <laughs> kind of, that's the kind of impression yeah. I get with you, but it's like, there are certain people that I can't meet because they were a childhood crush like a big old childhood crush yeah, now, yeah i know yeah. that you're a happily happily married man um, but indeed. have there ever been a kid and i know your wife very much lovely, but have there ever been, has there ever been an occasion where you've interviewed like your music crush 
I interviewed Debbie Harry. And, yeah. I mean, like, oh. I mean, I, like, she is, she was the first, first person I saw on TV when I was a kid that I felt like I wanted to do something. Nice with, for her. With Debbie <laughs> Harry. I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> But I really thought she was smashing, really smashing, <laughs> and that is a that's a feeling that, that that only matured and developed as the years. And she was an absolute nightmare. It was so bad because she's kind of she's Debbie Harry. She doesn't really give a fuck. She's like she does. I might have said this before. She she does cool and bored really well. If 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 I do bored, I just look like I'm. Um, when she does board, she's like, I'm stand, I'm leaning at the back wall of Studio 54 in 1979 board, and I'm bored because, you know, I've been here every day since it opened, and yeah, whatever. Grace Jones will be back in a minute when I can have some fun, but no. Yeah. Um, and she, yeah, we, we did this interview for, for a first time, we did the whole thing, and it was unusable. The interview was unusable. I was asking her about, I remember saying, what was the first time... Um, that you rehearsed with the, the the proper full blondie lineup. Why would I remember that? It wasn't like my first fuck or anything. I was like that. Okay. And that was the longest answer she gave. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. Which yeah, point I, I should, can you tell me about that as well? Um, but yeah, so, so it was so bad and we couldn't use any of the interview where I had to beg. And she was just, she just, I mean, it's perfectly fine. You don't have to, you know, if you don't like doing interviews, it's okay. Um, and it was like one word answers and she was just not bothered and disengaged. And maybe what? she was, she was tired. And we, we had to do the interview again, like about a week later. Yeah, because that happens, you know. And yeah. this actually was something I wanted to ask you was like, when, when you are faced with, and of course it can be because, you know, this is the thing when sometimes when people meet celebrities, I'm like, oh, you met so-and-so that, like, yeah, arsehole. But then like, it's, it's one, <laughs> it's, about but it's, I know they all say it, and they're all completely correct. I'm a real, <laughs> a real bona fide cow. But um, <laughs> but you you can people have off days, and uh, you know, and someone's like, "Oh, I met I met Matt Everett. He's a real arsehole." And I'm like, "What? He's really nice. What you want about? We well, must have been to." No, no one's ever said that, but that's an example. And of course, you'll get that with interviewing people, where it's like, "But I I do wonder, how do you navigate yourself through an interview?" when the person you're interviewing gives you one word answers. Do you like, and a, a few people that I've spoken to have a, and I'm wondering if you do too, do you have a bunch of questions kind of lined up in your cannon, ready to kind of, to shake things up, to wake somebody up almost? Like, not your regular, like, so what's your process when you write and what do you, <laughs> uh, but, but just something to wake them up even. Like, do you no. have those kind of go-to ones? No, I'll just, I'll just stop. I'll say, it's, it's cool. Let's just not do it. It's fine. I'll just, I'll just not do it because there's no point. Um, I, the thing is, I, I can, I, I, I'll do that now because I kind of, I can do that now. Whereas when I started, you, you want to do a good job and you don't want to let the person that's commissioned the piece down or the person that's making the show, you know, so I interviewed Evan Dando, who was just, you know, out who's, of his who's, door. Who's Evan Dando? Uh, from the Lemonheads, dude. Yeah. Really beautiful back in the day. Uh, brilliant songwriter. Ooh. And he was he was completely out of his gourd. And you, you know, you're there and you're battling and you're battling and then he's, he doesn't know what's going on really. And you, oh. now I just go, oh, that's cool, mate. It's fine. We've got everything we need. You know, yeah. off your pop. I because also... I don't want to do it. And they don't want to do it. So let's, let's both not do it. You know? But it, it's like it's... Um... One thing with music journalism that I obviously I, I, I learned very soon on is that as a musician, we need you as much as you need us. Like they go hand in hand. If I'm to be hostile towards somebody who's interviewing me, I'm going to get a bad review. So they're always going to get a free drink. But it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's, but yeah, there are days when people just, just yeah, there's going to be times when people just have a really, a really bad day but then again I guess now because I mean I guess with working with the BBC now as well 
Are there, are there lim okay, I don't know if you're permitted to say, but with working with the BBC, are there limitations that that brings with it as well? Well, it's mm, interesting. Good question. Um, thank you. Thank you. I, it's the BBC, so you have a responsibility to, to fulfil your role and, do, and do, do a good job, so not go in underprepared, you know, don't do your research, get it right, uh, don't, don't be provocative for the sake of it, you know, don't be a dick. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's, there is a way of, also, with, with some of these people, sometimes you're thinking, how many more of these interviews, interviews are these people going to do? If I'm speaking to, you know, Michael Stipe or, or, or someone, Kate Bush or someone amazing like that, you're thinking, well, Kate they, Bush. they might, they might not, Kate Bush, um, they might not do this again. Or then, you know, then there's like someone like Tony Allen, who we interviewed not that well, long ago. Well, I was going to you know, ask you, well, there's, yeah. well, there's the pressure as well on you because, because of the weight of the names that you're getting, right? I mean, they're just, I will send a link to people watching. They're just, they're beautiful interviews. Matt, I listened to, again, I listened to it at the time, I listened to it again, the Richard Hawley interview oh. is... Is so glorious. <laughs> what a lovely man and what brilliant anecdotes about, you know, that place he'd go to with his dad and he worked in the steel work is, and just beautiful. There was a really beautiful moment when he said he would give anything to go back to that time. I will send a link to it. But for example, you, you know, when you talk about uh, music journalists kind of you know, getting the scoop, you interviewed Tony Allen in just September gone. Yeah. And as a, as a fellow drummer, as well i was listening to that interview and it was lovely it was really lovely because i can tell how much he means to you as well oh yeah yeah how, there, how there, was there, that for you that one there is he's he, he's he's he was you know he had a very very long career so in the back of your mind you're thinking i am such an insignificant little blip in his in his radar even for today because he's thinking about music or something else so let's just try and make this um an interesting experience for him and a fun one and then hopefully i'll have done enough research that when i start talking about things he'll know that i know what i'm talking about so then he'll think it's okay because i'm just not you know i'm not important but you know it, it's yeah you want it you want to kind of do a good job you know, we mentioned Yoko Ono, and you're, you know, you, you're there going, I've got to sit down with someone who's, uh, whose art, let alone her relationship to one of the most famous musicians of all time, her art alone brought the avant-garde into the mainstream. She's an enormously important cultural force. And I'm going to say, so can you talk about the first time you met John? And I've kind of got to ask that. But you want, yeah, you... But I kind of don't. And I've got to make her feel like she wants to tell that story again. And maybe, so that, that's part of the responsibility, I guess. How much, um, because I mean, just how much homework goes into all of this? All your preparation? Oh. Is, is, it, is it a bit like studying for, uh, I was going to say GCSEs, but no one gives a shit about those. You can lie about them, <laughs> nobody checks. But, um, <laughs> but like the, the preparation you must, I mean, I'm learning a bit now, the preparation for these even, but it's not. But um, you're, there, there, is, there is so, you have, it's almost like you have studied absolutely everything about this person that you're interviewing. How much time do you put into that? I, it's, oh, how boring is it for my wife when I insist upon watching really, really, drab music documentaries all the time that happens a lot that happens a lot you just spend all your you know it's like it's music isn't it there's there's i'm sure your your inherent knowledge of music because it's what you do and it's what you've done since you're a kid would would give you the tools that's half of it it's not knowing what dates something was was released it's knowing um about what that person means in a wider kind of context you know I don't, yeah. it's, it's not just facts i think it's more and also just also being, I always hate it when in interviews, when, when a musician says, so that's the moment I did something amazing and the musician and the interviewer just goes, yeah, yeah. You, like, these are amazing people. You can be enthusiastic and excited about the stories that they're telling you because you are. Don't try and be cool. Most musicians are really nice. Most of the big ones anyway, are lovely. 
and they've all spent their time in crappy buses going up and down motorways playing to no one so that gives you a certain you know if you spent a weeks in stinking buses taking the piss out of the people that you're with though you know you could be Trent Reznor very serious intense man but you've done all that as well so it's okay you know I interviewed Trent Reznor for the first time and he was very serious and very intense and I asked him about Bowie and he said so so Bowie calls me and I went hang on what Bowie calls you out of the blue and he went yeah so come on that's that must have blown your mind he was like yeah, actually, it was pretty yeah. cool. And then you kind of, your enthusiasm and genuine enthusiasm kind of reminds them that, that what they're doing is amazing. What they've done is amazing. It gets them excited, so, you know, like, they've all got, also, everyone's got heroes. Exactly. You know, everyone. And so, you know, they might not be music. They could be, like, restaurateurs or authors or whatever. So your icons look up to other people. And so they're, they're fans as well. My, my, I'm so many Paul McCartney named up. I went to go and interview Paul McCartney at his studio. Everybody, and drink. Clink, there we go, sorry. Thanks, Sean. I bet Sean said that, didn't he? No. Nope. Mm. So he's, um, uh, and we do it in his office in his studio, and we're waiting for him to come upstairs in the corner at, of hang the... Hang on, so you do this interview with Paul McCartney at his office? At, 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 his, at his office above his studio in Rye and um, in, when we're waiting for him to come upstairs in this really nice posh office and in the corner of the office is a fucking big double bass a big grey double bass with white edging on it yeah. and the guy I'm with from the label who was looking after Paul was like that's that's Bill from Elvis's band's bass that's that's that's, and I was like, it can't be, can it? And then Paul walks up and we're like, is that, is that the double bass that we've seen in all those very early black and white Elvis footage? And he's like, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And he went over and he started playing Heartbreak Hotel on it. What and, the? Like, oh. and he was just getting, and there's Paul McCartney getting really enthusiastic about the fact that he, he's like, I bought this in an auction. It's like, isn't it brilliant that I've got this? I love it so much. I play it and this is, you know, and he was fanboying over... Um, but, but Paul McCartney starts playing an Elvis song. On, but, on the double bass that so played I, Heartbreak Hotel on, yeah. But, now, I know, obviously, you're a very big Paul McCartney fan. But I was told, maybe it's hearsay, there's a lot of these kind of stories that get bandied about. I was told that Paul McCartney famously says, like, I can only play my own songs. Didn't happen that day. Not that day. <laughs> Not that day. Except um, from when he met Matt Everett and then he did a rendition... <laughs> Yeah, anyway, yeah, what was, there was a point to the, before the name dropping story. Was nah, it? fuck it. They're all, they're all, they're all fans. I was trying to think of, of, of other sort of stories to tell you. Um, no, I, and the only one that popped into my head because I hadn't really prepared this was, you know, was interviewing um, some people that you meet, really famous people, are not like you expect them to be. Yes, and this is exactly what I would like. Yeah, carry on. They can be either cooler or less cool or more or less charismatic or funny than you expect. Sinead O'Connor, you mentioned, fucking hilarious. Really, like, so funny. Like, I really just an amazingly hilarious person. And I'm not saying, you can't, you don't necessarily, necessarily think that from her music. All of her music, shall I say. Yeah. Um, Simon, Simon Le Bon is totally Simon Le Bon though. He is, you know how you sort of see Duran Duran like in the eighties and they're all like swagger and glam and eye wink, eyebrow with Duran Duran, it's the eighties. He's yeah, still cool like that. Fuck. He's still like that. He's still, and it's funny because you, you are meeting the guy you saw on videos when you were a kid. Yes. You're not meeting like um, an off stage version. You're meeting, I <laughs> think you asked him, we were doing an interview about um, uh, just asking like a weird list of random questions. One of the questions was, what are your three favorite words? And he leans in front of the microphone and just goes, Simon, Le Bon. Yeah. Which is the most Simon Le Bon response. Really? Because it's often like, <laughs> I, I, often, I often find that like, and, and I'm wondering if you have, have had this, 
Man, I'm just really disappointed when I meet someone. I almost want like this caricature version of yeah, themselves. Yeah, 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 so yeah, 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 I don't want to see Nick Cave in casual, practical clo- uh, North yeah. Face. I don't want to see him in a waterproof. I want to see yeah. him, you know, drinking black coffee and like <laughs> scowl at me like, oh, I hate it, Dean. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I yeah, actually, I, I toured with him. I did like a gig with him. And like we had this polite conversation. He was, mm. I went what did backstage. You ask him? Well, I had an awkward conversation and I was backstage and I took a friend of mine, Steve, with me. And I was backstage and I was collecting my things from the dressing room. Nick Cave walks past, he's, sorry, I walked past and then Nick Cave stood in the corridor after everyone's left after this after show party and he's eating a pizza in the corridor. And I just burst out laughing. I'm mortal (laughs) drunk and I'm pointing at him and laughing. He's like, hey, (laughs) hey, Nadine. What's so funny? And I'm like, fucking Nick Cave eating a pizza. And he was like, and he burst out laughing as well. And my friend Steve, he burst out laughing. So we're all still in the corridor looking like maniacs laughing. And it stops and Nick Cave just goes deadpan. It's like, even vampires have got to eat. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing. That's I think, what you want. That's what you want. Just like you're saying, like he, <laughs> he knows what's expected from him. But have there... Have there been those ones like, yeah, Simon Le Bon, who kind of, you know, jovi- <laughs> jovially like, they'll kind of play up to it for you. For oh, no, 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 I think, I, I think, I, I think he, he is still absolutely there. I don't think, I don't think it's an act. And oh, I, don't mean that, great. I, I, I don't mean that as a criticism. I mean, he, that's exactly who he is. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really, uh, this is just me name dropping, isn't it? Um, yeah, but this is what yeah. we like. Is it that that's yeah? It's really it's most most people are really really nice. Yeah. Brian, you talk about people that are like for me. Meeting Brian Ferry is exactly like you want to meet Brian Ferry. Is my uncle he, Brian Ferry? He is. Is it Jordy? He's like I interviewed him in his uh, one of his apartments just down the road from Kensington because of course it's Kensington. Because it's Brian Ferry. Um, this apartment is is completely white, but draped with enormous, huge prints from his album covers and incredible art and heavy books, just as you want. And he was wearing like, in my I don't even know if he was, but in my mind Cut I down. remember. It, no, no, like 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 dark, sort of burgundy, ever so slightly too short trousers. Oh. Yeah, uh, with like mustard socks, sort of moccasins. Like he looked just immaculate um and he's he's exactly the person that you see and you've seen on album covers and you've seen in videos he's just as brian ferry as you could possibly want you know yeah i love it i love those people yeah i i do too and i think the more that i was listening to your interviews it's like there there was a i think i wonder what you think about this do you have to almost like leave your ego at the door when you go in to interview people and it's like, do you, do you know what I mean when I say that? Because I was talking to a younger, uh, a young woman this, today who was interviewing me and I was asking her, you know, what should I ask my Everett and blah, 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 as a music journalist, what would you have me ask people? And she, we were talking about mental health mm-hmm. and she said, sometimes, you know, you spend so much time interviewing other people. She said, you know, that it got to a point where she kind of lost her sense of self. And then she mentioned a t- going on a Tinder date and, and, gone and, and asking him loads of questions like a journalist. <laughs> like, yeah, so what are you, okay. and then when was the first time you did this? But um, yeah, but I think it's, um, it, it's, it, it's not something that, do, do you? Yeah, I, I, I know, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, you surrender a bit of yourself when you do it because it's not about, it's not about me. It's not about me. You know, I, I, I really like it when I don't ask many questions. It never comes across like it's about you, which I think is yeah. such a rare thing. You know, because if you're doing your job properly and you're picking the right phrases and the right words and you get meticulous about all this stuff and, and the room's the right temperature and all this kind of thing, you shouldn't be saying, you shouldn't really have to say too much. You know, no one really, you know, I'm not comparing myself to Michael Parkinson. Michael Parkinson d- didn't really talk that much, but he got the most amazing interviews out. You know, I think that's that's... I did, I, I got a review of a show once that really smartly, when they were like, Murder at Holy Sudden a thing. And I was like, yeah, I know, that's a good thing. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not about me. 
it's about them you know and it's about all the little nuances and questioning techniques that you've got that know how to ask the right thing at the right moment and just let people talk yeah. which is ironic because now all i'm doing is yabbing on and on and on at you on a phone no but it's this is like um like a friend of mine had commented and said like but you don't say very much in these interviews and I was like that's the whole point um like um you mentioned Michael Parkinson there I wondered also there's a journalist uh who who did an amazing review uh a few years ago his name is Joseph and his review was of um, a band called Radiohead (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it was a review of an album by Radiohead called A Moon Shaped Pool. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So for people listening, Joseph is uh, Matt Stepson, and he is a genius. When he was eight years old, he reviewed Radiohead. Over to you. <laughs> yeah, just... it, 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 it's... Well, I, 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 I love Radiohead. They're amazing. And, and Beth, my wife's big fan as well. And Joseph is <laughs> just all right. I mean, you know, he prefers Weezer, to be honest. Um, which is fine, and but we got the new record, a moon, a moon shape, or a moon shape poo, if you trim a couple of letters off, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> moon shape poo. I just got it, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and, um, and 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 wrote this this review. Have you got it in front of you? Yes, I do. It, 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 Please, I, 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 I better put it up online. And like it went everywhere, like everyone's. And he he was mortified at the time, which I can understand. He was like, "Why did you do that?" Uh, but now he thinks it's kind of cool. We've got it framed upstairs. He is, he is the coolest kid. And it's yeah. like, track one, Burn the Witch, a verdict, festival-like. Track two, I'll just say his verdicts. A long song, kind of boring. Track three, a good song, relaxing. Track four, my favourite <laughs> song so far. Track five, reminds me of boxing. Track six, a nice peaceful song. Track seven, don't really like it. Hard to hear what he says. No shit, nobody can hear that bastard. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> track nine. Um, no, track eight. Reminds me of Kung Fu Panda. It's just, I mean, it goes nice yeah. music. My favourite song. Like, and then, then the, no, the best one, sorry. Track 11. Could make people cry. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's glorious. It's so lovely. Yeah, and we, it's we, just, we... that really made me smile, that kind of music journalism. I'm like, Yeah. Yeah, he can, he, can, he, he can do it. And I know all the band saw it as well because I've asked them about it. And they were like, all oh, right, Joseph. Yeah, that was really good. It just, I mean, so you know, funny. music journalism. I mean, it's not, is it, is it a valid career? I don't know. I mean, well, I'd be, I, it is. Do, do, you, do you think, because when I was in menswear, um, music journalists were really powerful. We were all really scared of like, whether we get, a good review or not and it could totally make or break your career a review in the melody maker or the enemy it was a big thing we were really lucky uh one of our first interviews was done by Catelyn Moran it, did, it was really nice to us and like some other journalists along the way really kind of helped us but I, it feels now that there are some I'm not saying there's not brilliant music journalists you know Alexis Petridis is, is, is fantastic John Durant's great Miranda so these are all really talented people who's but that that it's not they're not relevant hopefully we are, but that power feels less tangible. And I'm, or, or am I wrong? I disagree with you entirely, but the, the reason I'm doing this whole scene... Yeah. Oh, sugar. I was, the whole thing, I'm, I'm not letting anyone ask me questions. Did oh, I'm sorry! You, <laughs> you did it, you yeah. genius. Anyway, yeah. but, I, um, feel, I feel maybe that, that's the case, but stop maybe it. you're wrong. But it's, <laughs> no, but I, I think music, but I've just always, um, one of the reasons I got into music was because of music journalism. Right. And after having my first bad review on the first album, that only made me want to work harder. <laughs> it was from Loud and Quiet. And they were like, can you campaign to keep us alive? I'm like, no. <laughs> no way and of course I I am, I'm holding a grudge <laughs> no it's been seven years from my first album review. and yeah and I you know what loud and quiet I'm going to post links to like, how we can support them it's so yeah. so important that put a fire in my belly that review did and I love them and it's listening listening to your like I said the different takes that you have on these artists that I love the Tori Amos one, the Richard Hawley one, there's so, so many. It's really important because also artists are so often asked um, to provide press releases and then they get watered down and watered down. You never, your artist words are never really how you want yeah. them to be until we have people like you, Matt, who interview us 
And then it's our opportunity without, you know, record labels or management or PR on breathing down our necks. You can speak freely. It's a Hopefully, really, yeah. it's a really Thank important, you. important platform and you've used it really well. But Matt. Yes. When were you first aware of music as a child? Oh, I mean, see, this is like in my, in my, you know, vaguely <laughs> egomaniacal mind. It's just, oh, I'd be really lovely to do a first time with me, but I can't. Um, it, no, I would love to. Sean, Sean, Sean did one with me for, for a sort of Q&A thing we did about the launch of the book. Um, the, uh, the properly, properly was, it's probably, it's, it's back to, it's Paul McCartney. Take a drink. Everybody. <laughs> okay, it was, was hearing, I probably would have been, I don't know, about five or six and listening to Yesterday uh, in uh, my next door neighbor's house when I, when I was a little kid playing in a house and I hid behind the sofa because I thought it was the saddest thing. It just made me feel really sad because, you know, I don't know why she's gone away. How, how old were you? Say. Do you know Five or six, I think. You know, actually, maybe before that, I remember somebody had a little record player and they had the Pink Panther theme. Do -dum, do -dum, do -dum. The original Henry Mancini. Henry Mancini. The... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mancini, Mancini? Mancini. Mancini. Mancini, Mancini. Uh, Mancini. And I remember just, just putting it on. Mancini's a very different thing. <laughs> Henry Mancini. Putting it on. I remember putting the, the little record on again and again and again and again and again. There's it, a weird thing about doing a lot of it. A lot of these, the very, very, very early things often tend to be the things that really shape people more than you would uh, imagine. So, like, you know, you can, I'm just trying to think of a good example here. Maybe it was David Gilmore or someone like that. And very early on in his career, he heard like a record by The Shadows and then heard like a big sort of expansive piece of classical music. It was like, well, that's it. That's, that's what you do. Your whole, the Pink Floyd thing is these huge sound worlds with this twanging guitar in the middle. It was there from the very fucking first thing you heard set the tone for what you did. What so did th those, those first things are really, really powerful. They, yeah, I agree. There's... Um... Miranda Sawyer was saying to me, so, um, she, asked, she asks people, you know, what posters did you have on your wall as a child growing up? Or, you know, when you, when, you, when you get stuck in an interview, ask people about their childhood, because it's really hard to lie about your childhood when you have to think yeah. on the spot. What, what music did you grow up with, like, in the house? Like, what did your parents listen to? Or, my, like, whoever, whoever brought you up? It was, it was uh, my, my, my dad seemingly didn't really like me he used to play classical do you remember hooked on classics this is going back a bit now hooked on classics was this really bad 80s um i'm not it was, it was like a classical music album but with like a sort of drum machine in the background so it was, bit, it was jive bunny for classical music oh, and brilliant. this was my dad's favorite fucking cassette that he'd play in the car years later i discovered all these amazing jazz records that you had by like oscar peterson and jimmy smith and uh Thelonious monk that are, and I've nicked them all. I've got them all, literally they're just under there. Um, but he never played anything cool. My mum was all the classics. It was it was the Beatles, Mums and the Puppets, Simon and Garfunkel. That was it. Abba, I got the foundation from that. Does has so, um? I don't I don't know if your mother is still with us or not. But like she, she she's around. Yeah. Does he, so does your mum know about? Obviously, how does your mum feel about you interviewing Paul McCartney? Because you know how sometimes when it's like you can talk to parents about careers and like yeah yeah yeah. And, we have a lot of like budding music journalists tuning in and it's it's not always a career people would think oh i could do that mm. but like the moment of validation when your mum must have heard about you interviewing paul yeah. mccartney well no the um in Mensa, it was be it was being on top of the pops oh that was, that was the thing it was like because like oh he's on top of the pops that was lovely on the um, telly on, on the, the actually, telly. actually on the telly oh. um and yeah she she's um she loves all that stuff. I mean, I miss her a lot because I haven't seen her for so long. Um, but she's, she loves the Macca stories because she was, she was a Paul, like when the Beatles were around, she was a Paul girl. That was her favourite of the four of them. But she's now, she, when I do, I do a podcast with Robert Plant, um, and like a non-BBC thing that we've been doing for a while now. So I get to sit and chat to Robert Plant. No. And... <laughs> That's what she likes, because she, she likes Robert. She thinks, because he's tall and Midlands and dishy, 
and she's you know oh well she's completely 100% correct exactly yeah there, um, <laughs> I'm, you know what I'm, I'm so gutted because the way this format works on Instagram live we only have an hour which leaves us with five minutes so I'm so we sorry can, I would love to do going we can do a part two <clears throat> let's hold let's hold on to this but um <laughs> for the last few minutes um I mean, we spoke about, I mean, I, I would like, I, I usually like ending with kind of your proudest moment, but I mean, it's obvious, like just the enthusiasm, the way you speak about Macca in that, it, it sounds like your proudest moment. It's, I, I, it's, um, I, I don't think there's one, because there's some of the smaller interviews, smaller interviews, there's interviews with less famous people that I think have been, have been maybe better interviews. Speaking to you, this is my proudest moment. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm really proud of all the stuff we've done on the first time. I'm really proud of Six Music. It sounds really cheesy. I'm really proud of working with Sean. Sean Keaveney, I love it. I still, to this day, I do, love it. Do you, get, do you get a real, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do you get a real sense, especially at the moment during, during like a lockdown, during these times, there's so many people listening to radio and I'm listening to you and Sean on the radio still. And do you get that sense of how important it is to people that you're there? Um, I, I, I think, look, I don't know. Everyone is, is doing far more important things than we are. But, I, you know, you do what you can do. This is but, the thing you can do is but, talk fucking rubbish on the radio. And if that's the thing that we do. And people, I think people like the fact that it's normal. When everything else is really, really strange and the ground's moving under our feet and we're worried about our families, worried about our friends, all this stuff that we know and we talked about a lot, that they can put the radio on and bang, there's Lauren, there's Marianne, Hobbs, there's, you know, Sean, there's the people that that's, and we're still going to keep doing that. It's a and beautiful that, thing. That I find. Yeah. It's lovely. That familiarity. Yeah. And is there, um, oh, that's, it's so important. Is there somebody uh, who is your, three minutes, who is your, um, is there somebody you, you, you dream to interview that you haven't yet, but you hope to? Grace Jones. Grace Jones and Shaka Khan. Oh my I've gosh. Never, I, I've, I've never done Grace and I've never done Shaka Khan. Both amazing, I think quite, quite difficult, quote unquote difficult, I don't know, quite singular people. Yeah. I will have to point you in the direction of uh, interviewing Miranda Sawyer and what she told me about Grace Jones. <laughs> Grace Jones snogged her and then tried to get her to go back home with her. Yes. And then, and then Grace, Jones, <laughs> Grace Jones saved her number in Miranda Sawyer's phone as Grrr. It's brilliant. So I think actually you'll find it quite an, quite an interesting, uh, quite interesting interview. Matt, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you so oh, thank much you. for your time. And, um, I hope we can do. Right? Is that all right? Yeah, you're brilliant, okay? love. You're totally brilliant. I mean, we're okay? all we're all half cut with the Paul McCartney drinking game, but um, yeah. I honestly... didn't. Even, I re... yeah. I didn't even warm up with Paul. I could do more on Paul. I could do oh, lots of. But I, I mean, there this, this should be. But it's such a glorious thing. It's like it, honestly, like your enthusiasm is so present. I'm like in awe of your of your interviewing technique. And honestly, like on behalf of like when I mentioned I was going to be interviewing and speaking to you this evening, so many people got in touch and they were really excited who were six music listeners. And just like you said, like you guys, you're doing a really beautiful service. Like, and, um, and actually I'm going to put people in touch with them, um, direct them the way of like the first times. If there is Thank one... You. And the one minute we have left, if there is one interview that I direct people to of the first time, which one? If there oh, has to uh, be one. Just off the top of my head, Mavis Staples. I thought it was going to be Paul McCartney that was going to... Who? No, no, no. Mavis Staples. Mavis Staples. And you've got yeah, one yeah. minute as to tell me why. Um, like, apart from bringing gospel and soul together, she was part of the... Um, uh, the, the the movement for civil rights in America. She was she, she she used to sing in the gospel choir next to Martin Luther King. And she's funny and just amazing. And th look, and also th thank you for 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 doing this, and thank you for you know being giving us you know such amazing music, man. It's a blend. No, thank but in, you, man. In, in a time when we have like curated playlists and all these kind of, it's really <laughs> it's really important. <laughs> Robots. It's really important that we celebrate the art of music journalism, which you do 
so bloody well, mate. Not oh, quite you. as well as Joseph. Yeah, right. No. Beth's son. He's but, um, <laughs> he, he is what we aspire to be. Thank you so much for your time, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. everyone, for Thanks, listening. Tomorrow, love. Bye, 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 bye. bye, bye. bye.